Study Healing, Episode 6, Yoga and Ayurvedic Training in India with former Swami Krishna Varma. The way that we met was, it's been like 11 years, 12 years now since we met. It's been a long time. Yeah. So I contacted you um, about 12 years ago because my daughter was having some mental health issues. And uh, I spoke with you about coming to your ashram and um, you had a kind of a makeshift ashram at the time. Now you have this big, beautiful ashram. But at the time, you had this ashram in Odayam Beach that you set up. And um, you agreed to let my daughter and I come and do a training with you for a month, yoga teacher training. And um, it really, really did help. It really made, it really made a huge difference. Um, but I wanted to introduce everyone to you because I love what you do. I love the training you offer. And I also feel like what you offer is really authentic yoga training. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, first of all, if you could just tell everyone what it is you do specifically, what it is that you offer and that you do. Uh, well, my, officially my title is a founder and director of Ayur Yoga Eco Ashram. The ashram I started in 2013 and near Mysore in India. Hmm. What I do is mostly, <laughs> <laughs> I okay. do teach a uh, few subjects of the teacher training. Like uh, my main topic is, my main specialty is in philosophy. So I teach about a philosophy for modern times. Also, I teach about Hatha Yoga methodology. That means the science behind the asanas. Uh, try to connect. Yoga is something more than physical asanas. That's uh, my main role as, as a part of the teacher trainings. But otherwise, we have a very good team of 30 staff and mostly managing the staff and looking after our farm. We are living an organic farm. And they were just talking to people. Yeah. One of the things that I've always loved about you, Krish, and that I noticed right away was that you are very, very humble, that you really listen to people, and that you also, after listening to people, you're always willing to go do research and you're always willing to learn additional things. I remember uh, when I first came to your, your ashram that there were a group of the, the students and you had a bunch of Western women. It was one of your first trainings that you'd done. And um, this group of Western women, they, uh, and we had some men in the course too, but um, you'd mentioned something about doing inversions and it being bad for our health. And the Western women all protested, you know, that no, it's not, no, it's not. And uh, that night you went and you read about it and you did some research. You came back the next morning and uh, you just in this very humble way told everyone that um, you looked into the information and that you'd reconsidered it and that it probably was not bad for our health, even though there was this long belief system behind it. Do you remember that? That was so long ago. <laughs> well, because teaching <laughs> yoga in India to Indians is different than teaching students from the West. Yes. So it was the learning experience. Probably you were in my second course ever we did yes. for the teacher training. Yes, yes. Since then, uh, we have done more than 70 teacher trainings. And yeah, each amazing. course is a learning, not only I'm teaching, but I'm learning about how yoga actually works for on different people in different ways, right. not necessarily what the book says. What are some of the main differences that you've noticed between the Western students that you've worked with and um, the students from India that you've, you've worked with? Uh, in India, generally, people are very flexible from the childhood for various reasons. Right. So we hold the asanas for much longer, talk a lot about mind. 
meditation as a kind of meditative practice and slower. But one of the biggest challenge while teaching for Westerners is uh, flexibility main issue. If we hold somebody too long, it can cause injuries. Mm. And asking them to close their eyes and focus their breath, it takes a lot of groundwork. We can't mm -hmm. directly get, get into that. So otherwise, I do love actually teaching foreigners more nowadays because uh, people ask so many questions, like mm -hmm. uh, the things that we feel like granted. We never question even in India. So right. that brings that curiosity makes me to take a second look, a deeper look. So while teaching foreigners actually is more a learning experience for me, more than teaching advanced practitioners who already yeah. knows everything, uh, they need very basic guidance. They don't ask any question, just do whatever we say. <laughs> so the, the Eastern style of teaching really has traditionally been though, that the student learns experientially and that the student doesn't come with all the questions, but the student learns along the way. And so has that, has that been a difficult transition for you to encounter Westerners that like want their answer right now? Um, what, it, what have you done to help yourself kind of um, adjust to that, that idea? No, I love people asking more questions. Yeah. Uh, of course, not in the physical asana classes, we right. can't talk much, but we have a separate theory sessions. Then more questions, the more better. Because a lot of aspects of yoga, normally we don't talk about it. And especially when we do courses and 30 day courses, every, our curriculum is very fastly moving. So we encourage people to ask more questions, the more better. Yeah. So what could, what can a Westerner expect when they come to your ashram uh, for a month long yoga teacher training? What, what, can they, what can they expect to find there? What things do they typically find difficult? What do they find easy? Kind of what, what happens from start to finish? Uh, there's both plus and minus coming to India to learn in the first place. Yeah. Like India is challenging, firstly, physical facilities, the weather, the food, uh, mosquitoes are various uh, physical discomforts. It's right. not uh, a travel time and everything. And in India, again, you need to know a majority of the yoga takes place in India uh, in uh, tourist places like Rishikesh, Goa. And if you go there, you will find hundreds of yoga schools. Firstly, right. it's difficult to make a choice which one is right, because every, every uh, yeah, very very difficult to make a decision based on small schools, hundreds of them. So when people come to our ashram, the first advantage is uh, we are located in a countryside, cut off from all touristy attractions or distractions mm -hmm. and uh, but other than good weather we provide the food and accommodation specifically to meet the international standards not necessarily luxury not necessarily like a, right. exactly foreign but at least we have western toilets and uh, we give toilet peppers and we have a clean and neat atmosphere and we cook the food without much spices so firstly, we, our ashram uh, is to make foreigners feel comfortable, not to get distracted with uh, all the health problems or the weather problems. Then psychologically, uh, we do not do, we do not follow any Western styles of yoga. Mm -hmm. Means. Even if you go to many yoga places in India, they teach you Ashtanga, Vinyasa. Right. A lot of that yoga styles are actually not originated in India. They're right. mostly developed in the US and the West. And right. the people come to India to learn exactly similar thing. Right. So we don't, we don't teach that. 
we teach only what we consider as a traditionally practiced by yogis from the olden times. Yeah. And so we base our teachings on the the actual, uh, not only the scriptures but uh, practice. And when we select teachers, one of the first thing in selecting teachers we see is how many years this person was practicing. Are they actually practitioners? Mm -hmm. So we try to bring authenticity into the teaching, uh, mm -hmm. which can be harder for a lot of Westerners students because a traditional way of teaching is we don't present PowerPoint presentations, our glamour of yoga, and mm -hmm. The very first thing uh, we teach in the very first class, I tell the people that you are not a yogi. Stop! Don't uh, stop! Stop fooling yourself as a being a yogi. The yoga purpose right. is not to make you as some superhuman or some special being, but yoga's purpose is to make you a better human. Yes. You had to learn your humanness and admit your plus and minus, your positive and negative, both equally, and don't try to become very spiritual yogis. Right. So that's where we begin with, and a lot of my my teaching is about deconstructing the myths about yoga. I, I love that, Krish. The myths about spirituality. Yeah, I love it. a lot of uh, people from the West come to India and try to become spiritual, which is very great. But mm -hmm. the idea of spirituality in the West is quite different than what is practiced in the monastic traditions I came right. from. So what is your view of um, what spirituality is? What does spirituality look like? Well, philosophically speaking, everything mm -hmm. is spiritual. Right. There is nothing yeah. which is not spiritual. So spiritual people really do not claim that I am a spiritual person. If you are telling that I'm a spiritual person, you're telling that others are not. Right. That brings in automatically, that goes again as the principles of Brahman, or the what mm -hmm. yoga teaches is about, the entire universe is one. Yeah. So instead of when people say I'm trying to become more spiritual, more healthy, everything they bring a lot of ego the i mm -hmm. but the traditional aspect is how to overcome the ideas of the i and overcome the ideas of i am being a healthy or better or not better all those comparisons and relativity right. it's more about increasing our perception it's not about changing the life dramatically right. uh, going for suddenly changing your diet and standing on the head, are doing a lot of fasting, are doing rapid stuff. They're good, but they don't not necessarily make a person spiritual. Right. And spirituality is more about uh, how we see or perceive oneself on the life in front of us. It's a change in our awareness more than just external changes. A lot of the times, uh, not necessarily in the West, even in India, a lot of people try to put on some spiritual clothes, grow a long mm -hmm. beard, mm -hmm. and wear all the spiritual makeup, mm -hmm. and think that uh, um, we are very spiritual. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we teach in the ashram is you don't need all those paraphernalia to prove that you are spiritual to other people. Right. The spirituality needs to be reflected in your day-to-day -day life, in your actions, right? Not necessarily in your appearances, right? I love that. I have I have a student of mine, Krish, that um, really sweet little girl. She's um, in her early twenties, and she recently went to work at a, a coffee shop that's right next to a yoga studio, and she wanted to go work there um, because she didn't she didn't know this consciously at the time, but she thought the other people that worked there were all very spiritual and she wanted to be around spiritual people, but she mistook style for spirituality. And, um, and it sounds like, I mean, that happens in every culture, right? Even in India, the spiritual people that are addressed, they, they may or may not be practicing 
the things that they've learned and the things that help you to, um, to let go of all of your rules and truly uh, see other humans and truly feel that connectedness and that namaste, you know, that namaste energy of really seeing their light, you know. And so she, she misunderstood that and she had a, a very difficult time. The other people that worked at the coffee shop were a little bit mean and, uh, and it was just really hard on her very sweet spirit, you know, her very sweet soul to have this experience. But it was ultimately really good for her to see that style definitely does not equal spirituality. Uh, by your definition, all of it would be a spiritual experience though, you know? Uh, seeing that would be spiritual. It's the ultimate goal of yoga, mm -hmm. to yeah. experience everything that goes on around us is, everything is spiritual. There's nothing yeah. which is not. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I love that. So what has been, um, the most difficult thing to change about your thinking in dealing with uh, Westerners and students, the people that, that come to your ashram? What's been the most challenging thing for you? Yeah, I would not say it's a challenging, but okay. uh, it's a more a learning experience for us as a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, it is hard to explain some of the subtle, subtler concepts. Like uh, mm -hmm. one of the main concept that I teach is about you are not this body and mind. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot harder for a lot of Westerners to take in. Uh, they like it as a theory. But yeah. when we go into details of that, what it means, I'm not this body, I'm not this mind. Right. Uh, if I tell you, you are not Rebecca, you are not an American. I like it. I find it, I find it refreshing. <laughs> like, but yeah, I see that. It causes mm -hmm. a lot of emotional drama in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And when uh, some of our teachings are like, there is no good and bad. It's all your perspective. Right. And for a lot of Westerners coming from Christian, Semitic religions, there's a morality like a Ten Commandments, do this or don't do this. Like in America today, people are so much divided on the party lines or ideology right. lines. Like everything is so defined. You're part of this or part of that. So the definition here is very, very stricter. But in yoga, the idea of morality or good and bad are very relative, depends upon what perspective you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So it's not about chasing something, uh, what other people think is good or bad. Mm -hmm. What is good for other people may not be good for you. What is bad for other people may be good for you. Right. So it's about overcoming the concepts of good and bad and the dualities. So firstly, we struggle a lot to explain uh, some of these concepts, which are very new because of mm -hmm. the cultural background. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of them slowly get it. They may not understand completely right away, but over the, when they leave the ashram, sometimes students write me back, now I understand what you mean. <laughs> right, right. So, it's mostly, yeah, um, a difficulty in translating those ideas that requires right. English is not our first language and trying to explain it to, into people coming from a different background. Mm -hmm. That's the main challenge. Otherwise, we are very fortunate because our ashram is known as one of the uh, strict place comparing to many other yoga places in India. So the type of people who come to our ashram is already well prepared uh, to expect a hard time. Right. Uh, they're well, uh, people who come to our ashram is generally people are very serious about yoga and spirituality and ready to listen uh, even right. the, some of the truths which may not be pleasant. Right. So 
comparing to many other places where I taught before, uh, where I teach right now, feels much more comfortable. Yeah. Because people are mentally prepared before coming and they know right. what they're expecting. Yeah, otherwise, uh, in yoga, we say there are no problems, no complaints. <laughs> right. No, I love it, Krish. And it's interesting, too. It's always been interesting to me because at this point, I've studied pretty extensively in, um, like, I studied a little bit in India, but really extensively in, in Thailand and China and Vietnam and Cambodia. And these are all places, including India, that had a time period where there was Western dominance and Western dominance um, from actual governments coming and taking over, but also um, Western dominance in ideology and shutting down a lot of traditional practices. And so it always made me wonder why I as a Westerner was being treated with such kindness when my culture had been so brutal, you know, and uh, brutal in, in all of those places. Um, so when you work with other swamis and other teachers, um, do you ever encounter some of that, those feelings of, I mean, I, I can imagine that having Westerners come, um, a lot of times we bring with us the mindset that we kind of want to hear what the East has to teach, but we also are very, very attached to our rules, our beliefs, our way of viewing the world. And so do you ever find that, um, that the teachers you hire, the swamis, that uh, they have to do a little bit of adjustment in their thinking to, um, to not be offended or not be um, even a little bit angry about that, that past, that history, and then, and then still the Western mindset of coming in and uh, being open a little bit, but also very argumentative, <laughs> you know? Um, have you dealt with that with staff members? And uh, how, how do you deal with that? Because that is a reality, you know? The kindness of the East and some of the good things about the West too, but a lot of arrogance and very um, dominant-minded thinking, you know? How, how are you dealing with that? That's got to be something that you've encountered. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Firstly, we try to see people not as a based on their nationality or the from which culture they come from. That's good. Yeah. And we do have sometimes a conflict in the communications or interactions, but we try to see from a human perspective rather than from cultural backgrounds or historical right. backgrounds which are not in our back, uh, in our hands. Right. Like right. in India, there are people uh, have feelings against the British as a colonizers. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. 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 And, but we do have a quite a number of students coming from UK, a lot of students. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, from yoga perspective, from our perspective, we have no issues, but I see some kind of a guilt culture from the student. Yes, yes. <laughs> they try to uh, put themselves in the, their shoe. Uh, sometimes, yeah, there is a, some cultural clashes happen, do happen, mm -hmm. but yeah. uh, we welcome that. That's how we have to learn. Yeah, and that how we can heal. At least we have interaction and uh, nobody is right or nobody is wrong. But the interaction helps to know us as a humans, not to be defined by our religions or our cultures and countries. So we are at least uh, creating a place for people to interact. Mm -hmm. I love and, that, Krish. And there are yeah. both sides. I do not say that East or the India is always the best or the greatest. Mm -hmm. Every culture, country has its own plus and minus. Yes. And uh, we learn a lot of stuff from the Western culture, too. And the good things and bad things everywhere. That's I think true. it's part of the life. Everywhere we do have that conflict, we have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you approach it that way. That's uh, 
that's an approach that really facilitates a lot of healing and uh, really helps people to let go of their strong identities with their culture so that they, they actually can find a place of peace, you know? Yeah, so so I'm curious, um, and I know everyone would be curious to hear about your background because you um, you spent time as an actual swami, correct? Do you spend time as a swami? Okay, so tell me about tell me about that and how you became a swami, um, and what made you decide to become a swami. And, and can we backtrack just a little bit and maybe tell people listening, what is a Swami? What does it mean for someone to be a Swami in India? Yeah, a Swami is one of the monastic titles. In India, we have the monastic life, which is like monks, like a, mm -hmm. in the Christianity, got a Christian monks, Catholic monks, a bit mm -hmm. similar. Uh, there are different schools. Again, all Swamis are not the same in India. Uh, I'm talking externally. Internally, yeah. everybody is same. Yeah. But externally, different. There are so many hundreds of traditions, schools, schools of thought within Hinduism or within yogic culture. And uh, some, of, some of them are quite different, completely sometimes contradictory. But basically, a Swami is somebody who gives up all attachment to the family. No family, that's the first rule. And mm -hmm. they live in a monastery, which is a solitude place, where they spend majority of the time on meditation and the studies. Uh, yeah, generally, and the goal is, the only goal is to get enlightened. Everything is else is not important. And the, well, why I choose that path? Mm -hmm. When I was in, when I completed my high school, I was not sure what, what, ki what kind of cur uh, career I should choose. There's so many options. I allowed so many things, doing so many things. But when I tried to see in the long term, none of them seems a fulfilling any job any career and i was already uh, studying a vivekananda's philosophy as a school kid as swami vivekananda is a great yogi mm -hmm. who came to united states in 1893 mm -hmm. and one of his teaching that impressed me as a kid very strongly i had it in my walls is life is short vanities are many they alone live who live for others mm -hmm. so basically it says that life is too short to waste the time on petty things right so i understood that part very easily the life is short everything is moving too fast but i was not sure how can we actually help they alone live, who live for others. What kind of stuff can I contribute to the society and the world? Right. So I thought, uh, let me go to Himalayas or the monastery and first get enlightened. Then I'll get to know the truth about the life. Then I will decide how am I going to help the world? Initially, I thought it's going to take me a year or two. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a fun one. laughs> But once I get in, uh, mm -hmm. even to understand the concept of enlightenment, uh, I had to struggle. What it means, knowing the truth, uh, how actually to get enlightened. Right. And it took me first five, six years in my first monastery, which is by Vivekananda's Ramakrishna order. But then still I was not satisfied with what the book says because i saw there's a lot of conflict between what the books are saying and what i saw in the real life mm -hmm. i felt a kind of hypocrite i uh, like uh, trying to profess some of the enlightened beings but i am not but 
my organization wants to me wants me to put up a face as right. I'm highly spiritual. They wanted me right. to be a teacher, all of that. So I was not completely happy there. I did not find the answers for myself, even after six years. So right. I've moved on to a different monastery. Uh, I learned a little bit there too, but still not my answers. Again, I went to another place, another place. So I spent about 12 years uh, going to trying different traditions within yoga, trying to have an idea of what it means being enlightened. Uh, so after everything, what I understood is uh, being enlightened, we don't need to do something different. Right. We don't need to do something, but just be as you are. Right. And being more realistic. So I gave up all my monastic titles. Or the, I came out of the monastic, monastic life. And I decided to learn not from the books and teachers, but from the real life. Mm -hmm. because I'm trying to understand the mysteries of life while sitting in a monastery, which is cut off from all the life. Right, right. So uh, after 12 years, my biggest, uh, what you call, <laughs> biggest moment is when I knew that if I really want to understand what is this life, I need to be in the middle of the life, not away from the life. Mm -hmm. So... I started uh, re-entering into the society, but again, I left my family and everything. So I said, I don't want to go back to regular life completely. So I thought teaching yoga to spiritual people might be a good way to re-entry into the society. Because we're all spiritual, no matter what. <laughs> <I> know, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, teaching yoga has become a kind of medium for me uh, to interact with the people who are not exactly like me, but who have a, a normal life and the day-to-day mm. -day life troubles and uh, how they deal with life. So since then, um, yeah, I'm learning more about what life is by interacting with the real people mm -hmm. more than uh, from the books and the great teachers. Certainly they are my foundations, uh, right. but I'm still learning the more and more I interact with the life. Yeah. So have the principles that, how, how have the principles that you learned in those ashrams, how have they been helpful in dealing with real life? Have you been able to practice those things with your real life experiences? Yeah, of course. Like yeah. uh, I just said, and the mona, there are many different systems and traditions mm -hmm. of yoga and yeah. My system where I had a, my strong foundation is called Advaita, right. non-duality. Yeah. And which uh, teaches us how to stay uh, detached, mm -hmm. not to be affected by the world's ups and downs all the time. Mm -hmm. And my practice of yoga and meditation helps a lot. So uh, definitely that background helps me to deal with all the what we call as uh, the drama right in the life right right that comes into so life. much of drama all the time i see in my staff students and uh, politics government all of that so i knew deep inside all the time that all this is just let it come and let it go yes not to react mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. So that, that has been my uh, greatest blessing because of my background. I can deal with the things uh, a little bit calmer mm -hmm. and not to get away with uh, so many changes around the world. Yeah. yeah there, um, so Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a, a famous Buddhist teacher, he, uh, I saw him in an interview and the person interviewing him asked him, are you always this calm? Is this something that, how do you, how do, you do this? Is this just like part of you that you're so calm? And Thich Nhat Hanh said, it's my practice. 
that it, it isn't, you know, it wasn't who he was necessarily, but it was just his practice and uh, that he had a dedicated practice of staying calm, of regulating his breath. And I noticed that when I was at your ashram with my daughter, she was dealing with some very difficult things. And there was a moment where, because you remember, there was um, some difficult times with that. And there was a moment where I was, in the room that you put us in, which was so perfect because it was right by the yoga hall, kept us nice and, well, it kept her confined <laughs> at the time. <laughs> but, but we were in there together and she's going through a hard time. And so she was kind of, we had a moment where she was um, just really kind of acting out, you know, and I was trying to just calmly parent and just keep everything calm. But um, there was a moment of intensity where she was, you know, kind of hitting and was saying a lot of things that were very unkind. And in that moment, all the breath work that I've been doing with you and all the yoga training, something kicked in. So I felt the most peaceful feeling I've ever felt in my life, Krish. I actually started feeling just this bliss, like just like so much happiness, so much goodness in the middle of, you know, my my child like hitting me and really saying, you know, like, you're 36 years old, you're washed up, no one's ever gonna want you, like anything she could say. And I remember just feeling like, the happiest I've ever felt in my life and just ah, you know and it was from the practice of doing the breath work and yoga that no drama could actually affect me you know when I was doing the practice um, that was amazing to feel and you created the space the environment the training the practice that gave me that strength you know, it was um, one of the hardest times of my life that I came to you. And I, I wouldn't have even have thought of it as it being hard for me because I thought this was about my child at the time. But, um, but I didn't mean to go there and get all this strength for myself, but I really got that from you. And so I feel uh, forever grateful to you for creating that environment and creating that authenticity and a place where we're, I was given the strength to handle anything in life, you know? So uh, do you ever have moments that, have you had those moments as well where that training, that practice has kicked in for you and you, you feel that peace that you never forget that once you feel it, you know? Have you had those experiences and can you speak to maybe one of them? Uh, I, I remember, remember what you told me you. about, oh, what? It's a, uh, uh, it is something that happens almost every single day. Every day, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like mm -hmm. we in the ashrams, we do live in that kind of dramas almost every single day. Right. Yeah, where, where there are students coming with a lot of emotional baggage to uh, yoga when they practice yoga. Suddenly, mm -hmm. it releases everything. Yeah. And we have we do see a lot of. A uh, lot of uh, students are sometimes staff. It's not easy living in ashram away from all the society. And we put mm -hmm. everybody to eight to 10 hours a day intense practice. Right. So it does, all the people feel all the pressure and it keeps coming up. Uh, right. Almost every day we do see. And the first thing I do is just take a breath. Mm -hmm. When the students are losing their balance or losing their emotional uh, they're trying to express mm -hmm. we tell them it's okay we accept that it's okay let them mm -hmm. express that whatever they need to and again we see that the same person changes completely after a few minutes or after a day or two on their own right. we don't try to do anything different but we just create the space i uh, just let the people uh, go through that process. Uh, yeah, everybody has to go through. We mm -hmm. say the road to the heaven is through hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And everybody has to go through their own emotional uh, lot. We do suppress a lot of emotional suppressions. They mm -hmm. need to hit the a ceiling one day and they come out and then we have the moments of aha moments. Right. Yeah, I love that you do that. There's a, there's a famous story about two monks that are 
uh, cleaning themselves by a river and uh, there's a scorpion that falls in the water. I'm sure you've heard this story before, but the scorpion falls in the water and one of the monk picks out the, the scorpion and the scorpion stings the monk, right? And so then the monk just kind of puts the scorpion down the side and, um, and saves it. And they're washing, you know, the two monks and the scorpion falls in again. The monk picks the scorpion up again and saves it. The scorpion stings the monk again and he puts it down. So the monk watching says like, brother, why do you keep picking the scorpion up? Do you not know that it's the nature of the scorpion to sting? And the monk that had saved the scorpion twice said like, brother, do you not know that it is my nature to save the scorpion, you know? And so I really think it is, it's such an act of bravery. I don't know that you would view it in these terms, but I think it's such an act of bravery to work with people in this the state where you know that they do get a little off balance. Sometimes they get a little upset. They think they're upset at you even. And to help, to provide a facility where they can heal and where you're able to just calmly allow for that and to trust that if they do the practice that they will get the clarity and so i have so much so much gratitude that you're willing to do that type of work uh, because it does take bravery you know on your part so thank you krish so i do want to <laughs> i do want to ask you Okay, so I was in, I do think it was the second class that you taught. And at the time you didn't have your big ashram, but what you created for us was perfect. It was so perfect. And you brought in teachers that were the very best teachers we could have had, very authentic teachings. Um, so when you first decided that you were going to offer this training and offer the certification to Westerners, what did, what did your friends and the other swamis and the people that you were, uh, you told about it, what did they think? Were they immediately excited? Were they skeptical? What was their reaction? Uh, the most of the, my connections with my previous monastic friends was, mm -hmm that we are not allowed to communicate especially with the women right okay there is specific uh and teaching yoga for money is again mm -hmm. not allowed mm -hmm. so to be frank lot of, i lost a lot of my friends there the moment i decided to teach yoga yeah. i lost uh all my i lost all my contact i could not tell them that what i do are there <laughs> people who knows what i do are not mm -hmm. interested in me anymore. Yeah. yeah. So again, it, uh, restarting the new life, uh, completely a different phase when I started teaching yoga. Right. But again, when I started teaching yoga initially, it was, I started with the basic yoga asanas and I saw that a lot of them are tourists, they're not mm -hmm. so serious. Mm -hmm. So then I started offering little longer mm -hmm. programs and at last, I found that a 30-day course is the right thing for me because people who are ready to commit 30 days is all very serious people. So it's a, it worked out well because of the I enjoy teaching the 30-day courses a much longer time because people there, they're not in rush to see something, do something. They have enough time on their hand to learn more deeper and asking serious questions. So it doesn't really matter what my old friends or other people think of me. Right. Even today also there are people who do not appreciate my style of teaching. Even my own, some of the colleagues, like we do have, I'm not the only teacher, there are at least three, four other senior teachers. And we don't teach the same thing because we come from a different traditions mm -hmm. and we have a different approach to yoga and to the life. And even today also, yeah, a lot of people think what I teach is a bit radical or they'll, I piss off a lot of spiritual people by telling them that you are not a yogi and you are not a spiritual. <laughs> you are a I, uh, mm -hmm. 
my specialization is more about highlighting the hypocrisy in the religion and the spirituality. Right. I continuously hesitate a lot of people and students mm -hmm. even, but uh, that's what I, that's what my style is because right. it's not just about teaching, but that's what helps me to understand right. uh, what yoga is. It's a, like teaching is not just about what I give to other people, but also what it gives me back. Right. I love that. Well, in most Western classes you go to, um, you're basically told like, welcome yogis, you are all yogis, you know? And, and so that can be difficult for someone who has had that and that reinforcement of ego to then go and, and let that go and just be someone that's doing the practice, you know? and to just be trusting the process. And so that's a, it's a very different approach than I'm a yogi and look at my style, you know? So, but so, so healthy and ultimately the place of really being able to be free to do whatever you would like to in life and whatever your dharma is comes once you've let that ego go. So I love that you teach that. So, so then you obviously found people that were willing to help you because when I came to your retreat, you had, you had everything we needed. You had an Ayurvedic doctor, you had other swamis helping us, you had um, a very famous swami that came and spoke to our group. And um, so you were able to find really amazing people that were, were there to help with the effort. Uh, was that difficult to find those people? How did you go about finding the right people? Uh, it has been getting much harder nowadays recently mm -hmm. because in the past few years, uh, myself living in a my own ashram, I lost a lot of contacts with uh, most of my older friends based in the Himalayan and North Indian region. Yeah. But always it's a difficult to, we keep trying. Uh, many, mm -hmm. many teachers every year, maybe we hire at least half a dozen teachers and maybe one or two might stick around. Yeah. And uh, luckily we have one great Swami called Swami Prabod, mm. And he has been teaching with us almost seven, eight years. Wow, that's great. He's an extraordinary Sanskrit scholar and very honest and one very authentic in what he teaches. Right. He has been a great support. Otherwise, with yoga teachers, it's very hard because a lot of yoga teachers in India too, they like to uh, go and teach in tourist places or go to foreign countries all right. the time. So it has been a great challenge to find authentic yoga teachers. We do have one great teacher called Sanjay and mm. he comes from a, a yoga family. His both mm. parents were yoga practitioners. His mm. father is a yoga teacher, his wife and his brother. So he has got a lot of uh, yoga as a background and he's very uh, kind and he's a very kind in understanding. He has been a great support last few years. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, it has been struggle always finding the right uh, human resources and the help uh, to run a right. place in a remote area. It sounds like you, you always do it though, and that, um, that there's always a way and that the right people appear. Yeah, and that's been my experience with you and seeing that. So most of the people that, that watch this will not be familiar with India at all and they will not be familiar with the caste system and with what it means to come from a yoga family or other families. Can you just briefly uh, tell everyone um, what it means to come from a yoga family and kind of how the caste system works in India? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a caste is a huge factor in India even today and it mm -hmm. controls everything from individual's life to jobs to marriages to the schools you go to and the politics, everything. But I would not mix up yoga with a caste. With a caste, okay. And yeah. the yogi, uh, somebody practicing yoga, 
they mm-hmm. are not uh, at least in theory not supposed to associate with any religion and caste okay but as i said everything on the books is not and the reality is not seen <laughs> so there mm-hmm. are yogis who do uh, associate with religion and caste but generally my theory is once somebody practices yoga they need to i would not say that all religion and caste is bad but you don't want to be limited by that right yeah otherwise yoga is mostly practiced in a caste called brahmins mm-hmm. and a brahmin families people are from the childhood they have access to read the scriptures and uh, um yeah just it's a traditional lineage a lot of the brahmin families but in our ashram we don't follow or practice a caste system and not necessarily in fact none of our senior teachers are from brahmin caste right well from a western mind it wouldn't even register that the caste system um like to to a western mind it just wouldn't even be a factor you know and so it's interesting because when i when i go to places i go to nepal quite a bit too and i'll hear, hear stories of people that um they were great like i have a good friend who's an amazing singing bowl teacher and he was friends with someone for a very long time and he did a lot of trainings with this person and then uh this good friend of him also a friend of his also from Nepal um found out my friend's true last name which showed what caste system he was from and even though they were both adult men now um the the friend of my teacher the singing bowl teacher uh would no longer associate with him when he found out that he was from a lower caste and it surprised me at first to learn that that was still going on that that was very much a part of culture in Nepal and in India um but it's also yeah we have a uh, staff um uh, mm-hmm. some of the local villagers uh, who work in our farms the couple of a couple who work in our fields mm-hmm. they don't eat any food in our staff kitchen because the cook in our staff kitchen belongs to a different caste right they don't enter they don't touch any food <laughs> yeah so the western mind doesn't even understand that at all you know and um it's like it would be like me trying to tell you that some random person is famous like they're famous for playing racquetball you know or something like that and uh, and I would be all excited about it and you know really have all this respect for this person and you would think I don't get it I just don't understand you know I can't I cannot feel any type of um like uh feeling that this person is a great person or anything so with the caste system the western mind doesn't understand that at all and it's it's actually one of the good things about the west <laughs> you know i think mean, especially so, in america i right. love this country because here everybody has an opportunity to succeed right yeah you put in hard work it doesn't matter what our background says like right. uh, there's no other place i think that gives you that much of opportunities it really does a great equalizer yeah Yeah, I love it. Okay, so Krish, I just want to ask a couple more questions before we go. So, what is your so who is your ideal student? Who would who does best coming to your ashram and um who is your training for? Keeping in mind they have to come all the way to India to do it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Somebody who has been practicing yoga at least for 2 to 3 years. Mm-hmm. And they already had looking something more than asanas mm-hmm. because of course we do teach asanas but our ashram is specialized in explaining the science beyond the asanas and that's first qualification first uh, ideally students who are not new to yoga but had an fx experience and secondly somebody who is open minded uh to 
hear things about themselves and not to take offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because some of the spiritual teachings that we teach can be quite radical and for some students it can be hard to digest. And so we ask, request all the students be open-minded, don't come to conclusion just by one lesson, one class, wait until you get the bigger picture. And uh, yeah, if suppose somebody has that open mind, I think that helps a lot in saving their time and our time. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I highly recommend your ashram and I always tell my students about it, my massage therapy students, because massage therapy and yoga go hand in hand. They're all part of the same health practices, uh, dietary practices do as well. Um, when do you plan to, right now, I know it's difficult because we're still in the middle of this pandemic, but when, when is your projection that you'll reopen your ashram? We are hoping for next summer, May or June. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, I highly recommend it. It was life-changing for me. And, uh, and I know for so many other students of yours, it's been life-changing. You don't forget those experiences, you know? It, it always makes you question your thoughts a little more. And uh, it really led me to question any heightened emotion that I have at all, to look more deeply at it instead of believing that it's a reason for action. I actually believe it's a reason for inquiry, you know? So thank you for that. So you, um, how many, has it been two years since you got married? Is three years now? I can't believe it. Time goes by so fast. So three years ago, you got married to Lily and she's actually there with you. So Lily is an um, amazing person and she, uh, she, you guys have done so well together, but I think that's also a benefit to people that come from the West too, and especially the Western women that come, that Lily's actually lived there in India, that she understands the culture, she understands the benefits, the wonderful things, she also understands the difficulties. Um, so with having Lily there, what has Lily shared with you that has been the most wonderful thing about living in India with you and also the most difficult thing? What has she shared with you about it? Because it's interesting to be in India as, an, as a Western female, you know? <laughs> is, she, is she willing to come on? Is she willing to? She doesn't have to. <laughs> okay. Lily, you're so amazing. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Okay, so I, I think that's fascinating. Wouldn't you have been really interested to hear this too from someone in your position before you went to India? So, so here's, here's, here's my question for you. What has been the most difficult thing for you about living in India as a, as a Western female? And then what has been the most wonderful thing about it? Yeah, well, I have to, I think... Um Put a note first that living in the ashram in India is, although we are in India, we live in a bubble. We yeah. kind of have our own community. And although we do have, you know, Indian staff and teachers, we're not having to go out on, on the road every day and uh, interact right. with the normal society. So it's not, right. not exactly like living in India, but um, we are there. Yeah. And I think... When, when I first went there, the most difficult part was not being able to just jump in a car and drive myself anywhere I wanted to go. Yeah. Because driving there in India is crazy. Right, right. <laughs> and, and also, you know, it's, it's um, as a foreigner, um, not really knowing the rules of the road or, or not being completely um, accepted as a, as a, person who originates from there. Um, right. It's a little more risky. Mm -hmm. But uh, so th I think there were some freedoms mm -hmm. that I kind of switched. Um, like, 
what I really enjoy about living there is that we have our life nurtures a healthy and positive lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, we get to meet people. I always say we, we get to meet the best people from all over the world. And yeah, we don't have yeah. to go anywhere. They come to us. Yeah. <laughs> because the people who come to our place are really, truly inspiring and motivational. And they all mm -hmm. come from different backgrounds and different. They all have their story. And so it's it's really inspiring to, to get to meet them and get to know them and mm -hmm. share, uh, share yoga with them. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So there's, thank you, there's a number of things with India. So India is one of the most amazing places I've ever been. It's also one of the most dangerous places I've ever been for for a Western female. And so I highly recommend your ashram um, and I highly recommend that if a Western female goes there that they go straight from the airport to your ashram first uh, because because it is, I don't know, I guess any culture that still has to put this cab is safe for women on the back, you know that cab is probably not safe for women, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> that it'll only be when it doesn't have to say that, that it, it's safe. And so, um, so I really recommend uh, that my students go to your ashram recommend to everyone because you really do have some safety measures in place, you know, and, and I love that I love that you're a Western female and that you've gone through the whole experience, that you know what I'm talking about, you know? So, but there's no place like India for, I mean, it's a motherland, you know? It's where all of that spirituality kind of, every culture develops their own, but it spread through all of Southeast Asia, it went up into China, you know, all of, um, all of that is so heavily influenced by India, you know, the um, Katakali dancers and the Kalari Payatu martial artists, all of that is like a foundation that spread up through China and, and the seeds of that are all still there and you, f you feel it, you feel it when you're there. I would recommend yeah. come soon because yeah. India is changing very fast. Yeah. It's becoming globalized. Western mm -hmm. materialism is feeling changing the society. Changing, yeah. So better to visit India soon before it becomes another. <laughs> and another. Mm -hmm. I can see that. I think you're right in that. Okay, well, I want to thank you guys both for the amazing work that you do. I'm so hopeful that you'll be able to come out to Utah and actually my students will get to meet both of you. Um, that would be the most amazing thing. Yeah, I would love it. And then in return, hopefully, um, you know, I would love to be able to provide you guys both with some really great massage and with um, a really healing experience here. So, well, thank you. Yeah. And we look forward to seeing you in India when we. <laughs> yes. Um, this is all better. Okay, I will definitely come out. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, both of you. Hey, I, thanks for taking the time. Bye, Lily. Bye, Chris. Okay. <laughs> Bye. For information on becoming a licensed massage therapist, visit zmc.edu. For information on continuing your education in massage therapy and body work, visit studyhealing.com. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe.